Successful Minds with Patricia Barnowski Schneider, the show that takes you around the world to share interviews with some of the most successful and relevant people on the planet. Hear their stories and get the most important business lessons they have learned on their road to success and get exclusive advice on how to implement their success into your life and business. Successful Minds with Patricia Barnowski Schneider is brought to you by the Strategic Advisor Board and your host, Patricia Barnowski Schneider. Hi, and welcome back to Successful Minds. I'm your host, Patty Baranowski Schneider. Today, I'm joined by Alina Fernandez of The Positive Mom, where she helps moms find peace, break cycles, and feel whole. So thank you for joining us, Alina, and tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you, Patricia. I am honored. And what I do is I have a mom community in a blog where my mission is to help moms really find a way to break all the cycles that, that keep them stuck and to help them with that find peace and feel whole in motherhood because one of the things that I always say is that motherhood is equally triggering and transformational. <laughs> and so while, you know, there are really highs with motherhood that are also really lows right. and, and, and it doesn't start with being a mom. It starts actually way back in our childhoods and, and during our life experiences. So on, on covering that and crafting that story and reframing that past so that we can move forward. Right. No, it's very good. I mean, and you know, people, you know, it's actually funny. My uh, son just had his first baby last night, actually. And it's oh, one of these things where it's like, you have no idea what you're in for. It, it is the emotional roller coaster. It, it's a yeah. lot, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Congrats. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know, perfect timing for this. So I was like, wow, oh, okay. <laughs> now, what is, yeah. So tell us, what are some of the unique challenges of motherhood? Oh, my, you know, <laughs> so I, I alluded to that, but with motherhood, everything comes up to be healed. Anything that we haven't unprocessed, anything that we haven't, unex, you know, expressed, right. anything that we're storing that we didn't know um, that was bothering us is going to come up because we're going to feel inadequate. We're going to feel um, that we don't know what we're doing. We're going to feel like all of this insecurities that we thought we had resolved everything that we really need to be a mom and to be a human yeah. is going to be we go through those challenges so really the, there's a lot of exhaustion of right. course there's a it's very trying physically but emotionally is where we get stuck because it, it, there's so much emotion into everything and you, uh, whether you want to do it right or you don't know or you think you're doing it right, you're yeah. still going to have those feelings come up. So emotionally, it's very taxing, um, even if you have all the help to make it physically comfortable for you. Right. Yeah, I just had this conversation with my son yesterday. It's kids don't come with instruction manuals. So I always say you do the best you can with what you have. And, you know, there is no right or wrong. What works for somebody doesn't work for you. But you always have that, especially with the movies and social media, you have this idea of you have to be perfect, especially you want what's best for your kids. So you always have that. I have to be perfect because my kid's going to be the best. But, you know, perfect, you know, again, what is perfect for you? Perfect means they're in a good school. Perfect means they're wearing the best clothes. Or perfect means they're in a loving home. Like, it's just so much and your head is just a mile a minute, you know, so it's it's a rough thing. Yeah. And, you know, that's being a parent an involved parent, I would say, is the fastest way to figuring out that perfect is an illusion and that control does not exist. Yeah. It is the, it is then that you figure out that if you had any attachment to plans, right. then you're going to quickly, <laughs> quickly let go of plans. Right. Everything is so unexpected and, you know, there's so much spontaneity. There's so much um, just unknown in parenting. Yeah. And, and that, it is tricky too. Like I remember even, you know, when I was in school, you always had this like all your friends. Well, they're the perfect family. I wish I was in that family. They're always so, you know, you assume. And then as you get older and you're having play dates and it's like, wow, 
that home is, you know, like I remember one family, it's like the dad's an alcoholic, the mom's never home, this kid, I, there was so much wrong in this family, but it's from the naked eye. I was always like, I wish I wasn't that, you know, yeah. It, 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 and then now as a parent, you're thinking, oh, my kid doesn't like me. I wish I was a parent like them. Well, you behind closed doors. No, you don't, you know, so. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so one of the interesting things about being a parent and I always say a mom because I talk to moms is basically you kind of, you know, start reliving those childhood wounds of you uh, that you experienced and you over or tend to overcompensate for those. Mm -hmm. And, and when we don't look at our child and what the needs of that child are, even when we are over parenting and we are over giving and we are overly present for something we might they might experience ne experience neglect and that's why i always say that a, the best parenting style really is child led because i parent all my four children i have four one is 20 one is 19 9 and 3 wow. <laughs> And so, that's again, starting all over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, uh, and it's a joy. But, uh, but I parent them all differently. They're all different people. And they all have different needs. And they feel loved in a different way. They feel supported in a different way. So if I kind of attach myself to when I was a kid, I wanted my mom to do this and my dad to do that and my teacher to do whatever. That doesn't work for my children. Right. Yeah. No, it's, it's definitely true. <laughs> yeah. Now, what's been your experience with the judge, I guess, with the judgment from other moms? Oh, my. That is, that is something that, you know, I'm not against a lot of things. That is one thing that I think is so detrimental because the thing is, like I said, not 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 everything works in a how in a home for every child. But what I think somebody else should do is probably the worst thing they could do. And so uh, to be judgmental of other moms without knowing their whole story is absolutely detrimental because we need each other to support one another and to understand one another. There's such a great opportunity to learn others' perspectives, to learn other stories, to learn other others' way. And uh, of course, you know, we, we don't want to support anything that is uh, hurtful to the child. Right. Um, but even if there's something that we know could hurt, um, there are ways of saying it and ways of supporting that person uh, that go beyond judgment. So I think when you're judging, uh, you're projecting. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that I do when I find myself judging somebody is say, you know, what is it? How is this showing up in your life? And what is it about yourself mm -hmm. or your past that you, that is showing up right now? And that puts me in my place real quickly. <laughs> No, but you're right. Because I mean, if you just, you know, if you had that, say, for example, a family where you, you just felt like you weren't perfect enough, or you weren't doing enough, you were all of a sudden assume that that's what the world sees in you. And you're trying to do better, trying to do better, because you're trying to please your parents when that's old now, now you got to focus on your kids. So that's good. So it's almost like mixing a little psychology in with it. Absolutely. And so I, I always there's a, there's a, system i guess or a process a practice that i always share um, by byron katie and it's called the work mm -hmm. and it has four questions and one turnaround so it's like five steps right and the first question asks is it true so let's say i see you know some mom and i think like oh my gosh she's she shouldn't be doing that you know and then you ask yourself like is it true is it true that she shouldn't be doing that oh yeah it's not good Right, you were gonna go there, but it's like, is it absolutely true? That's the second step, and it's like, well, I don't know, I don't know, <laughs> absolutely, right? right? And then the third one is, how would you feel if you let go of that thought? How would you feel toward that person and toward yourself, right? I would be maybe understanding of her, so I would be, I would feel good right now, not judging somebody else because it doesn't feel good right. to judge. And the fourth one is basically the turnaround which is 
you know, how am, how is this happening in my life? Um, and basically, that's how you know that it's something in you is is needs to be healed or needs to change. And so turning it around, uh, it, it's not in a way of being self-judgmental. It's just seeing, wow, you know, I do this in this way in my life and I, I'm bringing awareness that it needs to change and that I can do better. So it hurts us when we judge somebody else because it, a lot, it, it kind of encourages to be perfect. So mm-hmm. if I say, oh, you know, she should have a bedtime routine, right? Uh, and she's a horrible mom because she doesn't have a bedtime routine. Right. What happens is I fail with my bedtime routine because my child regressed their sleep. And now I'm a horrible mom because <laughs> I decided that this sleep time routine is what makes a good mom. And that it, it, so basically all of the judgment that we make turns back at us. Right. Oh, she shouldn't be eating that. She shouldn't be feeding her child that. Well, there's an emergency. There's nothing to eat. That's the only thing right. I have available. Now I'm a, I'm a horrible mom for feeding that to that child. Right. And, so, and so basically when we come from compassion to other moms and saying like, oh my gosh, it, I don't know if maybe she doesn't have anything else to feed that child. Maybe I should bring dinner to her. Right. That comes coming from compassion. And then if somebody brings dinner to you one day, you're not going to be like, does she think we're starving? Right. You're going to be grateful and say, right. wow, you know, I know what it's like to, right. to receive this dinner. So basically, you know, it makes us more grateful, more compassionate, but not only for others, but for ourselves when we don't judge others. And we're going to judge others because I do it all the time. <laughs> but when we do, then we can have that awareness of turning it around, looking for where in our lives this is, you know, hurting us or where is it coming from? And then, you know, trying to be compassionate because we're not perfect and mm-hmm. we're going to do these things that yeah. we like. <laughs> no, I mean, it's so true. I like that, though. But it's it, it's so funny, like the cycle of life, like you don't realize how everything is just all comes back from one thing, you know, and uh, it, it's, it's good stuff, though. <laughs> <laughs> now, how do you deal with the unrealistic expectations from social media? Ignore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's really, um, it's really interesting that you asked that because it's like they're only expectations if we take them on. So for me, it's just content. And some of it is entertaining. Some of it is sad. Some of, some of it is inspiring. And some of it is like, oh, good for her. That's not my life. But that's really cool that she gets to do that with her child. Uh, it's not an expectation that I'm willing to impose on myself. And so I think it's important for us to separate, you know, that kind of uh, because it's not just social media, it's movies, right? Like, um, I would be very, very sad if I looked at friendships on on movies and like how they're best friends since they were children and share everything together. And I don't have friends like those. My, my best friends live very far. And so we, we get sad when we have expectations and it's very to let go of any expectations, especially when they come from outside. We need to live from the inside in and understand that, yes, I want to set some expectations for myself, but it's from a place of what would I be in love with in my life if I did, you know, what would bring me so much joy? What would I love? You know, what would my life look like if I was in love with every little thing around me is different than, oh my gosh, look at Pinterest. That's what I want to do because so-and-so did it. (laughs) They went on vacation to this place. I don't like the cold weather, but they did it. So I want to do it now. You know, it's like, no, it's it's not an expectation unless you take it on. So that's that's how I do it. And, And sometimes 
Patricia, it would be something that I, I would like, oh, I would love that. Right. That's awesome that she got to do that celebration first, right? That's so awesome that she got to do that. I think I would love it too. I can ask her how right. cool that she modeled that for me right. and that it's possible. And now it's in my awareness. And now I even know a person that knows how to do it. So when you come from, not from jealousy, but from admiration, mm -hmm. it's like, so cool and 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 i have a saying like oh i'm next <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> but it's funny like i um always use an expression never expect anything and you won't be disappointed because it's so many times you have these expectations and it doesn't happen so i say like even though i kind of know or expect that this is going to happen in my head i'm like i don't expect it and if it happens that's a great surprise and you're not disappointed then so you just kind of you know but it's, um, it is hard, like social media and all of, like you say, movies and everything. It's a hard thing because you have this. Um, and again, like you said, you don't know what goes on behind closed doors. So you might have this celebrity family who's always on the, the spotlight and they're dressed to the hills and they're going here, going there. But maybe at home, once the door's closed, the mom's having a drink. She's exhausted. I've had cameras, you know, and there's no love, no interaction. There's no, no you don't know this, but just from what you see, but it's a tough thing because everybody else it's in your face on everything and yeah. it's, you know, hard. And that's where, again, the kids don't know this, you know, that'll, so as a parent, you're, you're thinking you're, you're disappointing your kids and it's, it's a big cycle of emotional stuff. So. You know. Yeah. And you know, it, kids are people, so we can ask them, are you disappointed? Right. What, would, what would disappoint you? And, you know, I have a practice in my home that I ask them, did you feel loved today? Yeah, that's nice. And sometimes it's like, yeah, I felt loved when you, you know, pet the cat. And I asked you to pet the cat and you pet right. the cat. And it's like, wow, it's so <laughs> easy. It's so easy to not disappoint your child. Yeah. And if we only ask him, if we only observe, you know, because sometimes they're tiny and they their words, you don't understand them. They're like, blah, blah. Yeah, <laughs> <It's> yeah. like, <laughs> like but you can see the reaction. You can get feedback, right? right. And so, um, again, this is coming from our childhood. This is coming from things that we saw outside of them. Right. Um, but if we come from the child and we ask them, you know, what would make you really happy? Right. Then they they tell us. <laughs> they tell us. And sometimes it's a cardboard box. Right. And, you know, it's actually funny that you say that because I grew up in Manhattan and um, you, you didn't have front yards, backyards or whatever. And it's funny because we would sit on the stoop every day. And if somebody threw away like a refrigerator box or something, I was the happiest kid because we would go in the box and stare up at the sky. All the toys in the world meant nothing to me. That cardboard box, though, it's funny that you just say that. But yeah, you are right. Kids, they don't yeah. need much, but we just assume that they need and want this. But reality, yeah. they don't need it. They just want you. Yeah. And when those assumptions come, it's like, what is it in, in me, you know, my little inner child, what is it telling me? And then it might just be saying, uh, you know, you really wanted this as a child and you didn't ha have it. And just sending love to that child and saying, you know what, my child is a different person. It's not right. my child, it's somebody else. So let me do what they want and that's how you honor yourself uh, but we think we honor ourselves by following what we wanted as a child mm -hmm. or what that's we right. think the the child wants and and you're right it, the, those boxes are so fun yeah, exactly <laughs> <laughs> it's the little things <laughs> <laughs> so now tell us what are the benefits of having a community of moms to rely on for support oh i love that because you know um when i started my blog in my community, I it was from a dark place where I felt so alone, Patricia. Mm -hmm. You know, I had just become a single mom, and I read this letter, and I just immediately was in the, in the child in 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 the fetal position mm -hmm. on the ground floor, just you know, feeling that cold tile and tasting those salty tears, and just thinking, I'm all alone. I just might as well die. Like, I don't know what to do. I have no idea what, what's my next step. I have, I had a one and a two year old at that moment and we would, we experienced homelessness and it was, I didn't know how to drive. I didn't have any money. I, 
you know, uh, my family was overseas because I'm an immigrant to this country. And and so it was really dark. And, and when I got out of it and it was, you know, this inspiration that I had that I didn't know what to do, but I, I could write what I could be. Right. And so I wrote my first to be list, which is one of my daily practices now. And I get, <clears throat> I always, it always gets me because, you know, it was so, so dark and so, so painful. Um, and that was 18 years ago. So I've had extra, an extra 18 years of life. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm grateful to be here. But in that moment, I, I just said, if I'm alive, then I'm going to make sure that people who feel like I felt right. know that they're not alone. And so that's how I started. And so, you know, had I had a community back then, right. I would have been like, oh, I, I'm just going to call Patricia, right? Yeah, right? And I'm just going to, and she's going to walk me through this. Right. And maybe you won't give me any advice, but you could at least listen. Right. And so that's what, you know, what community is. It's not having a lot of people around you but having people who see you who are safe with your emotions and that support you when you need to and that you are able to then also offer that support and it is crucial because the moments that are the darkest you know and this is studies show that there's a ton of research that says it's not the experience of adversity that you go through mm -hmm. it's being alone in that adversity that causes trauma Right. So you hear about PTSD, for example, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder versus people that experience PTG, which is post-traumatic growth. Mm -hmm. So two people go through the same experience. One is traumatized. One is stronger and mm -hmm. more grateful for their life. And the difference between those two experiences is the amount of support that they received. Mm -hmm. And so as children, we all go through, you know, it, whether it's at school or at home, mm -hmm. uh, because we're very susceptible and sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, and being a positive parent is buffering those adverse childhood experience for, mm -hmm. for our child. But, but then when we're adult, we still need those supportive people in our life to buffer those experiences. Because like I said, motherhood is transformational and triggering. Sometimes one is not without the other right. but if we have a friend if we have a few friends if we have many friends right. that we can come to when we're feeling that not only we're going to be stronger right. when this happens we also can stay alive because many of us have those intrusive thoughts that's you know for me they started at five years old mm -hmm. and they come back and, and I thought that there was something wrong with me because mm -hmm. those, I had those thoughts. And now I know that it's, it's, it's something that just happened as a trauma response. But if I have those safe people in my life that I can walk through them and so can everybody else. So mm -hmm. it's crucial, Patricia, to have those people. It's good to just, you know, you know, to have people to bounce things off of and different different people because if you just have say your one family well you have your own type of thinking that that family was just raised on but you know if you're having issues with your kids and you just don't know what to do maybe it's a discipline thing an eating thing or whatever and you're with a bunch of people and you could be like my god you know this is what i'm dealing with and you get people say i went through the same thing did you try that and someone else says oh if that don't work try this so you're getting different perspectives but you're sharing your frustration your fear your whatever with people who are, have been through the same thing you are. So now you're like, how oh, do we understand me? You know, so it, mm -hmm. it is important, you know, and like I had the issue when um, I was a single mom to two kids and I didn't have family back then that I could turn to for help. So I'm doing something that I've never done before. I have no clue what I'm doing and I have nobody that I could do. Like but this is pre internet era and pre all of that. So yeah. <laughs> I didn't have any, anybody to turn to. And I'm like, it caused more mental trauma for me because now I feel like a hundred times more failure for my kids. So yeah. I, I agree having somebody that you can turn to that can guide you and, and just even bounce ideas off of. It's really crucial, not only for your mental health, but just, you know, because that affects your children. And so that's awesome that you have that and encourage that. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes it's not so much the guidance because I know that a lot of people hold back 
yeah. in supporting someone else because they just don't know what, what to do. Like, for example, I've never experienced a miscarriage. And that is a devastating loss. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know what to say. I can't offer my personal experience, but I can be an ear. Right. I can just listen. I can just be quiet right. and listen and allow for that person to express their emotions and just let them know that they're valid. Mm -hmm. And that's what's called validation. So sometimes you don't need to know what to say. And, and sometimes it's better not to say anything. Yeah. Because sometimes it's like, okay, oh, you could just do this. And it's like for that person, it's not yeah. a just, right. it's a really hard step. So, so it goes both ways. And, and I think starting leading with silence, leading with tell me what's going on and right. letting that person without any interruption, just express what they're saying. Sometimes they're like, at the end of that vent, yeah. they're like, oh, I know what I'm going to do. Yeah. I'm going to yes. do this and that. And then you just validate like, yes, yeah. that sounds like a great step for you. Maybe not something I would do, right. but, but you, you look lit up about right. that. Yeah. Go but ahead and try it. That's a hundred percent true. Cause I know a couple of times, like I was dealing with stuff and I remember like my husband's the type that I'll bend to him and then he's dissecting and he, and then we get into a fight over it. Cause I'm like, so I remember one time I went through this and then I called my son and I'm just like, blah, 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 blah. and he just listened. And then I felt bad. I just like unloaded all of this on him. But I felt so much better because I'm like, that's all I needed was for somebody to just listen and get it off my chest. I'm like, oh, I feel so much better now. So some people might need somebody else to give them. But a lot of times, just listen. And then yeah. just let them know, wow, now I get it. And yeah, that's exactly. it. That's it. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and if you feel that there's something that you have to offer, right. because we do, we have lived experiences, but be sure that it's something valuable for that person and not just that right. you just sound smart. Right. <laughs> because, for sure. you know? um, <laughs> so, so, but if you, and I know you, I know you know this, <laughs> I, I'm just talking in general, but, but if there's something, then I can, I can ask and say, you know, Patricia, can I offer something from my own perspective and take it or leave it right. you know, or, or take what you need from that. But mm -hmm. I just feel very, like, I feel an urge to share this with you, right. um, but I, I'm not, in, I'm not attached to it. If right. you think it's trash, put it in the trash, yeah. you know, that gives that person permission because sometimes when you're in pain or when you're worried or you're going through some kind of struggle, then now you have this added pressure like, oh, I think Patricia's going to get offended because she told me to do it this way. Right, right. And, and she was there for me. And now it adds more stress. <laughs> so, so if you are, you know, uh, offering something that you feel is of value, make sure to allow the person to make their own choice and that they right. know this. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's so much mixed up in all of this. So this is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Now, what advice do you give to new moms about finding and joining like a mom community? Well, I think that the first thing, uh, and, and I love this question. Thank you, Patricia. I think that the first thing is to actually know that it's a per place where you find belonging. So many times we, we join an aspirational community. Mm -hmm. And what that means is like, oh, look at her. She has everything together. I want to be just like her. Right. And so that's not your community. You're <laughs> <Right. laughs> going to feel inadequate all day long because that image that she's trying to put out of all together right. is going to be damaging for you. You're going to strive to be like somebody else. So be in a community where you can show up as a mess. Right. And, and you know how they say, I'm not married, but, uh, but they say like that you marry the guy that sees you in your pajamas and, yeah. and accepts. that's the kind of girlfriend that you need to, right. it's like right. when you're at your worst and they love you and that's the kind of community that you need because you're not going to be at your worst all the time. Yeah. You know, that when you are, you're in a safe place right. and that's, that's the, that's the word is safety. You join a community where you feel safe. You find friends that you feel safe with. And in order for us to feel safe, we need to be validated. Mm -hmm. So you can start trying out and seeing like, oh, I put up a post that 
I yelled at my child and it was all crazy mm -hmm. and people started judging me, then that's not the place that you need to go right. to. The place to go to a place like that asked you, oh my gosh, what do you need? What's happening in your life that you yelled at your child? Because we know you don't want to yell at your child. We know that your heart is broken that you yelled at your child. So what do you need to get to a place where you're not yelling at your child? Mm -hmm. That's the place that you want to join. And so you just, you don't post, let me just say this. You don't post that. You go and look at the place and see how they're responding to other mm -hmm. people that are posting that. Because mm -hmm. it's really a risk. I mean, it could bring you through depression to just risk your heart into a friendship or community and then receive that invalidation so mm -hmm. so i think join look around and then click the leave button or then or if you feel safe then you start to interact and i think right. that listening and checking for safety is the best thing that we can do right that's all really really valid now this one's a little off but what tips do you have to say veteran moms on how to best support their moms what was that veteran moms? Well, like people who've been moms report, like yeah, how do yeah. they support the new moms? Yeah, I, I know, but it's like, is there such a thing? Yeah. <laughs> I know we're all still a work in progress, you know, exactly. <laughs> I don't care how many kids you have, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, veteran moms, you know, I think that it, like, maybe let's stop thinking about ourselves as veteran moms. Yeah. That's that's what I'm thinking. That's what my God is saying. Maybe we need to think about um, being mentor moms. Yeah, that's better. And and seeing, you know, let me take this person under their under my wing, you right. know. And um, and if there's an age difference, I could even think because I'm 46 and my oldest is 20. Uh, but I could have a 26 year old very easily. So if I see a 26 year old having their first child, I'm like, oh, my gosh, how would I react if this was my child right. having their first child? You know, right. I would be really loving. I would, you know, I would feel really just supportive and like taking on like making you know what it is rooting for her right. and and helping her succeed and putting you know betting on her right. that's what i would do um and i would i would see my younger self and all the insecurities that i had right. and and thinking oh my gosh she needs some help but right. and not thinking or assuming that she has the same insecurities because this is where we go wrong right? right but asking her you know i could say let's say you're the younger mom and i'm gonna be like or not younger but first time right, right. um because i'm 46 and i just had a child yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so i would be like you know patricia when i had my first baby right. i was feeling this way and this way and this way and this may not be your experience, but if you're feeling like that in any way, please confide in me right. because I'm here to support you. And I may not know exactly what to say, but I can listen. And I know how hard motherhood is. Yeah. And even when it's good, it's hard. Right. So let me know if I can be of help. Right. And so... Uh, again, I don't feel like a veteran mom, uh, even though I homeschooled, I've homeschooled for 12 years. Right. And I've, you know, my, my first one is out of the home, my second one is about to be out of the home, I started all over again. And it's like, I'm learning everything all over again. And it's so different. Like even all the baby gear is different from when I had my first child. <laughs> There was, yeah, we had flip phones when Alicia was born. Now when Alicia is born, she's like doing Zoom because there's, you know, she was born in 2019 and, yeah, and that's how we communicated with everybody. Right. So if with video conference and all of these things, um, even that experience that I had with being on the fetal in the fetal position on the floor wouldn't have happened because I would have sued my dad or... Right whatsapp him so you know things are very different so we can't right. always assume that we know better than someone else right. because their experience is different and also parenting is different every day that passes by for sure so so i think 
shedding the veteran mom and new mom labels and don't just right. be a mom who needs help. And it's, um, you know, it's tricky because like the veteran moms, um, I could say, yeah, you know, I'm ki- I have kids, grown kids, grandkids, the whole bit. And, you know, it's funny because like my kids always say, oh, you know, when they see me with the grandkids, they're like, oh, I wish I was like you as a mom. And I'm like, I wasn't like this with you as a mom. I, it's, you know, again, single mom, I'm like, they were another job for me. I'm like, it was so frustrating and, and stressful. And, you know, I, it, it was a lot. I just, just, I had to cook, I had to clean, I had to do. So I wasn't giving that love, love, love because I had so much going on where now I, my only job is to have fun with them. So it's different. So even though I'm a veteran mom and I could say, oh, you know, I've raised my kids. I, my experience is I can only see you and, Again, times have changed, things have changed. So I could, like you say, just listen, offer my advice if I have it. Um, and I do the same thing. I'm like, that's all you have to do. I'm just saying, like, here's what I would do, but maybe that won't work for you. You know, I'm just kind of giving ideas, but yeah. it's, um, yeah, it's good to get perspective. But like you say, everybody's situation is different. Like um, when I was pregnant with my son, I remember going to eat, it was like at a diner or something. And the waitress, like everybody was ordering drinks and, you know, here I am with this big belly and they said, um, you know, she's just going to have a nice tea. And there the was a Russian woman and she's like, no, no, no. You know, I had, I drink with all of my babies, but that's her, how she was raised. Yeah. And it was like considered normal. No, no, no. You should have a drink because that's what we do. Well, that's not what I'm doing, you know, but okay. Yeah. Appreciate it. But, you know, so you can yeah. only give your, your thoughts, but it doesn't mean you, your, your way is the only way, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I remember, you know, when I was pregnant with, you know, I love that because I was pregnant with Eliana and uh, I had my my seven. Well, when Elisa, Elisa was seven, 12 years ago, she became vegan. And and so we started eating plant based in our in our home. And then eventually I became also plant based and I decided to have a plant based pregnancy with Eliana, who is nine now. And so I remember people sending me horrible articles about what happened with someone because she was pregnant and ate only plant-based and their baby, you know, really graphic, horrible stuff. And it's like, I, I get, you know, I'm not sending hatred to this person. I get what you're doing. I see that you're worried about my baby. That's really sweet of you to be worried about my baby, but maybe my baby would also not be okay with me being seeing these images and reading this content so sometimes uh, yeah the advice that we give we we need to see the not and i call it intent versus impact my intentions might be really amazing but i need to be thinking about the impact that that's going to have in the other person because it's it's probably more harmful and it is to for a pregnant woman to see those those images uh than to you know, not eat meat their whole pregnancy. So, uh, so you know, it's really interesting that you talk about the the wine and all of that. You know, it's it, there. There are so many camps: the breastfeeding, uh, the bottle feeding, versus the amber, you know, necklaces. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. it's like <laughs> you know what? If you're loving your child, and if it works for you, if you think like in your situation this is what's good for you, do it. Yeah. And a fed baby is is all we need. A mm-hmm. safe baby is all we need. A, a happy, healthy baby is all we need. Mm-hmm. How you get to that is really, you know, secondary. Yeah. yeah, it's your own story. It's not somebody else's. Yeah, yeah. So I guess that kind of tops on this one. So what are some of the best practices for creating a safe and supported, um, you know, mom community? Yeah, so validation, validation, validation. It's my first, you know, it's going to be my first answer to that. When somebody is in pain, when somebody is is struggling, feeling uncomfortable, feeling insecure, you validate their pain. You say, you know what? Yeah, that sounds hard. Uh, I I get that. Or maybe I don't get that, but but I feel your pain. It it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be... uh, I, I, I've never been through that, but I'm really sad for you. I feel the sadness in your words and it breaks my heart. So that's all we need. That's all we need to say. Um, we don't, you know, we don't need to offer advice. We don't need to say, 
oh, that's nothing compared to what I went through. Right. It's, like, um, it's not about you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. I always tell the story, Patricia, of when I, when I was 19 years old, that was the most horrible year of my life. Um, in March, I was kidnapped oh, by a stranger and he, you know, obviously assaulted me in every way. So I, you know, and almost, almost killed me and I was able to escape that and so people kept saying like oh, what a miracle like at least he didn't kill you and at least you're not pregnant and at least he's going to jail and this at least content is lethal and people are like saying that a miracle that they're grateful and they forgot to say my gosh that must have been horrible is there anything you need? Do you want to talk about it? Do you want to be left alone? What do you need from me? And my heart is broken for you. So none of that was there. So in October, in so it's for six months, I wanted to die. I was just like, I feel so alone. I, I don't feel grateful that he's going to jail. I don't feel grateful that I'm not pregnant. I don't feel grateful that I even survive now because I'm all alone. And now I just have to live with relieving this memory. Mm -hmm. So in October, I'm in a car with my friend and his girlfriend and my brother. And the car flips. And I end up in a coma for eight oh days. God. And in this coma, I know, in this coma, same year, 1996, in this coma, I'm... I can hear everything and I can see everything wow. and I can hear the words of people. And now they're suffering. Now they're like, Oh, poor girl. Oh my gosh. I am so heartbroken. Like she hasn't had a break. She grew up in, you know, in abuse and poverty. And then she was kidnapped. And that's the first time that I felt loved mm -hmm. is when people shared my pain, when people yes. saw my pain, when people expressed that what I went through was horrible. Now I'm like dying, but I want to live. Right. I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah. I want to, you know, and I woke up and I had 19 broken bones and it was, it wasn't pretty. I, I had my mouth taped shut, like, so that I could heal my jaw. I had m my ribs in a, in a brace. I, it was, it was crazy. Like learning how to walk again, not being able to like, eat or if it wasn't out of a straw but I was the happiest I've ever been because people showed love to me by saying we want to support you and this is painful and that's that's the number one thing that's the number one best practice that I can share when somebody's hurting tell them that you see their pain and that they're you know don't tell them that at least they didn't go through this don't tell them that they still you know like an example I've seen in groups like, oh, but you still, uh, you still have time to get pregnant again. Or, but you already have three children. Or, you know, just things like that, that are just so invalidating. So best practice, don't invalidate, don't put that motivational shame on people. Right. Make sure that, you know, whatever they're going through, even if it looks small to you, they're going through it. They're expressing it because it hurts them. Mm -hmm. So say, you know what? I, I am sad that you're hurt. That's mm -hmm. all. That's practice. Number two, I would say, be there for people. Be there for people and, and take a couple of minutes because you don't know when that's going to be you. Sure. And, and as busy as we are, because we are, we have a lot of things to do. Um, it's going to help that person, but it's going to help you. Mm -hmm. Because one thing that I always say is a positive mom is on purpose. Mm -hmm. And when I take time to talk to you, Patricia, and to be there for you, now I feel better about my life. I feel like I, I am helpful. Mm -hmm. I have a purpose. And that's going to help me when I don't, that, when, when, I'm, when it's rough for me, I'm going to say like, you know what, like, I told this to Patricia, I'm going to take my own advice wow. and I can even resolve it on my own. So it makes us really stronger when we are strong, uh, you know, for other people. Mm -hmm. And number three, share your mess, share mm -hmm. your mess, because you know what? Like it, it helps other people as well. There's no, um, uh, what do you say? Unrewarded good deed. Is that what they Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No good deeds go unpunished. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 
and fun. Is, yeah, exactly. So guess what? When you share, you're not only sharing for yourself, you're sharing for other people that haven't yet voiced it. Right. And it's validating for them. But also you need that validation. Don't let people tell you like, oh, validation is for parking. No, you yeah. need that. You yeah. need you need to hear that you're not alone. You need to right. hear that that somebody understands you in life because life gets really unbearable, especially when you have little ones that depend on you and it's not a reciprocal relationship. It would be wrong to expect your children to give that to you. So, so you need to get it from another adult. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's actually funny that, um, what do you call it? When you say about, um, you know, sharing your story and stuff like that, it is true. You know, a lot of people, you don't want to air out your dirty laundry, but it does help because you never know what someone else is going through. So it does help them to know that, yeah, you know, I'm really not alone. And, you know, even your situation, I mean, it just sounds, oh my God, so horrible. And it kind of, you know, no matter how bad you think your situation is, when you hear other people, it's like, you know what, maybe my situation's not as bad as I thought it was. You know, I didn't go through all that. And, you know, then really seeing how strong you are from it. It's like, wow, you know, I, you, you never know where your strength comes from, but, you know, you obviously have it. And, you know, sorry that you went through all of that. It, it really just sounds horrible, but you've made such a great thing out of it, which is awesome, you know, and helping other people. And again, it came from feeling supported because because I didn't feel I was I didn't feel strong when people were motivating me. Right. And so that that's why I share it, because the contrast was so crazy. Right. Right. When and when somebody's telling you, oh, you should be grateful that you survived, it's it's not a good feeling. I I wanted to grieve. And there, you know, allowing ourselves to grieve is huge because that's the only way that we can process that pain. That's where the strength comes from. Right. It's not from what I went through. I don't, you know, I don't say like thank you, God, that I was raped and kidnapped. Right. I say thank you, God, for Elena at 19 years old, getting out of that situation, having the strength, having the, the foresight, you know, uh, to get out, even though every odd was against her. Right. Um, so thanking ourselves, right. really, and not thanking our perpetrators and our abusers and the people that hurt us and the thing that happened. I'm not grateful for that. No, yeah. I'm grateful for me. And so when we reframe it mm -hmm. like that and, and we say, you know, Patricia, I, you know, I, don't be grateful for that horrible thing that happened. Be grateful that you had the strength to survive it. You are a survivor. You are strong. You are this. That The conversation is really different. Right. And it's funny. I actually saw a meme recently, but it totally is applicable where it says, um, I forget how it went, but it was something about, you know, when you go to somebody's funeral and everybody's talking about, oh my God, such good times. They were so, and it just said basically all of that stuff that you're saying at the funeral should be said when the person's alive. Exactly yeah. For them to be gone because they don't hear it now. You know, so that's 100% yeah. true. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's that's what happened. You know, I, I'm in a coma and now people are saying what yeah. I needed to hear all along. In 19 years, I didn't feel like anyone cared about me. Right. You know, it's funny, too, because I just had a conversation with somebody recently and they were, you know, it's just like a parent thing. And then, you know, they just I didn't even realize it, but they happened to realize, you know, he's never once even said that he loved me. And it's like, wow, you know, it's just a few simple words. I love you. And that would just make mean so much to somebody. Yeah. But people just take for granted. Oh, they know. No, they don't. You know, I mean, <laughs> oh. have you heard about the five love languages? by mm -hmm. Ch Gary Chapman. Well, Gary Chapman has his, this book called The Five Love Languages, where he, you know, interviewed, well, and treated, he's a psychologist, a lot of couples, and he found out that they spoke different love languages. So the, the husband may have a physical touch, for example, language. So he hugs the wife and right. he thinks he's loving her, but she has words of affirmation as a love language. Right. So he never tells her that she's beautiful but she doesn't feel loved she doesn't hug him because that's not her language right. so he doesn't feel loved but they love each other dearly so we need to learn how the people that are around us receive give love mm -hmm. and to not only understand how to give it back to them 
but to also understand when they're doing it to us and receive it as love. So, you know, uh, I might not need for you to tell me you love me because words are not my thing, but maybe I need you to be there with me because quality time is very important with me, uh, for me. So I have learned the love languages of all my children and the people that matter to me. And now I know none of them have gifts as a love language. So I don't need to buy the gifts. Yeah. <laughs> like my life became more expensive. I saved so much money because they don't care about gifts. They care about quality time. And so I go do experiences with them and they all feel loved. Yeah. When I sit on the couch with them and we watch something funny or whatever, right. I know the ones that need that hug. I know the ones that don't need the hug. Yeah. So it it simplifies it for you. Yeah. And it, it is true because like I'm not much of a verbal person, but I would give my heart and soul to people. I'm always helping people doing stuff. And in my head, but they know I love them because I'm always there and I'm always helping. But maybe they don't. Maybe they're just thinking you know, that's all cool. So she, you know, was there, but she never once even acknowledged me, you know, and it's, it's, it is exactly. true because I'm thinking they know, but maybe they don't know. Yeah. yeah it but, sounds like uh, your acts of service. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but it is true. I mean, well, it is kind of funny too. Like even one time with my husband, like we were fighting, it was a snowy day. We were fighting and he, uh, so I went in the car and of course my car gets stuck on like snow. So all of a sudden I see him driving and I'm like, oh boy, here we go. And he just gets out. He says, get my car. And he came and shoveled out the other car. And I was just like, like I, anybody else would have been like, oh, well, sucks to be you. And just kept on going, you know. But, you know, that was like his way of saying, I know you're a jerk. That's fine. But just go home. I'll take care of this. You know, it's, it's like these sometimes these little things. But yeah. again, this is many, many years. So now we know each other's language, so to speak. But you're 100 yeah. percent right. People sometimes need that affirmation in their own way, you know. Exactly. Yeah. So finding out what those ways are it's huge right. and then you knowing that you know for example uh my dad is very words of affirmation <laughs> and whenever he affirms me i know that he's giving me love because that's his love language so you know it's it's really interesting because i wouldn't have translated that to love right. maybe um, so it's really also seeing that other person's intention it makes the relationship better Right. This is awesome. Now, what are some of the best ways to foster a sense of belonging, connection in a mom community? I think that the, the best way is to have that safety and to understand that, you know, some things are going to be different from your perspective. Right. Um, so you, you need to create a, a community of diverse people, right. diverse by backgrounds, diverse uh, perspectives, like I said, diverse ethnicities, di diverse uh, ages. So you need a, a different component there. Right. The community is going to be more rich, you know, a lot richer when you have diversity uh, and when you include everyone. And when you have rules, specific rules for no judgment. Because, uh, and, and I say, you know, that's another thing to look at, look at the guidelines of the community, because a lot of the times things are going to be different. And I go back to that example that you had with the, with the alcohol in pregnancy, right? right. Um, a lot of times that goes against your values. Like I don't drink alcohol, whether I'm pregnant or not, but that's me and not to impose that on somebody else that wants to have wine or whatever. You know, that's, that's their life. And so I always say, trust yourself with, you know, trust people with their own lives. Right. And so that is definitely a way to, to create belonging. Because if you, if you trust that that's what they're doing for themselves, mm -hmm. um, you share with respect what your, uh, your experience or your way is and say, this is what works for me. And it's not prescriptive to the other person. That's going to create that. Um, and with belonging, you have to advertise that. Mm -hmm. You have to say this is a community that that accepts everybody. Right. And so you you can't just go into it and because people sometimes we exclude ourselves. Right. Sometimes we start seeing faces and they all look like a certain way. Um, and sometimes that way that they look is perfect, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so you, if, if you're running a community or going into a community, you look for those places that advertise that they want real people that, you know, because real people aren't perfect and perfect people aren't real. And, and that nice. they, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and they bring and that they welcome all those people. Um, I tell you an example, when I was pregnant with the Lydia, I was 42. Yeah. You said even I was... going to the obst obstetrician wasn't safe. Like she, she went and looked at my age and she's like, oh, you do know how babies are made, don't you? Like, <laughs> yes, I <laughs> thank you very much. And actually, you know, it wasn't a pleasant experience with this one, but thank you so much for reminding me. Uh, yeah. You know, because I, apparently I was too old to have a child. And so, um, you know, you want to understand that there's no sexism, there's no ageism, there's no ableism. So as a community owner, I advertise that I, I love everyone. I include everyone, no matter what they're going through or who they are. But as a community member, uh, also, I look for those communities that are inclusive and that they say it right off the bat. Right. That's good. Now, anything else you want to add about what you're doing, what you're working on and things like that? Yeah. So, you know what I'm doing right now? I, this week, I'm going to Boston and, and sharing my third TEDx talk. Wow. Good for you. Uh, nice. Thanks. So, and I just came back from South by Southwest where I was speaking about storytelling. So doing a lot of speaking and writing my book about validation nice. and, just you know, loving the community. Because one of the things that I do love about my community is that um, it's not like I'm the leader and the the queen of my community I'm a member too and we I learned so much from everybody and it's so rich and beautiful so growing my community is definitely something that I that I want to do and it's free mm -hmm. so nobody pays to be in the community and we just share it's, it's just a place to to give back because you know I don't want any more Alinas on the ground floor <laughs> right yeah. no, for sure <laughs> so how can people get a hold of you and learn more about you they can go to thepositivemom.com. Okay. Uh, and I'm on every social media platform known to man. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> At the positive mom is my handle. And so, yeah, and that's how they join the communities by going okay. to thepositivemom.com too. Nice. Well, thank you again for being on the show. Again, everyone, that was Alina Fernandez of Positive Mom. So thanks for listening to Successful Minds with Patty B. Never miss an episode by subscribing to the show. So thank you again. Thank you. <laughs>Thank you for listening to Successful Minds with your host, Patricia Barnowski-Schneider. Please leave your feedback and visit strategicadvisorboard.com to get the latest and greatest business advisement on the planet. Follow us on social media for updates, and we'll see you on the next episode.